Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about something I assume, or I personally think, think it's, a, it's very critical to this uh, ecosystem, uh, which is scaling. Um, we've seen um, you know, uh, interesting things happen in 2017, for instance, with uh, uh, CryptoKitties, uh, which hit, uh, which basically um, caused the entire Ethereum network to, to basically stop working. Um, and before we can solve the scaling problem, I don't think we can get much adoption in this space. So today we have a great lineup um, with uh, Mo from Seller, Clarence from Elastos, uh, Kosala from uh, My Ether Wallet, and Max from uh, Zilliqa. So um, I guess um, I'll let everybody introduce uh, their projects, and in particular, how they um, solve this, uh, the scaling problem uh, within their project. And uh, Kosala can talk about uh, my Ether wallet, of course. So let's start with, uh, with Mo. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mo. I'm from Seller. And uh, Seller is a layer two scaling uh, platform that focuses on bringing layer two scalability using state channel technologies and also side chains and roll ups uh, to existing blockchains. Uh, right now, we are the only and first uh, state channel network, generalized the state channel network live in the world. Uh, right now, we are running on Ethereum. And uh, our goal is to bring instant and extremely low cost transactions to every blockchain and therefore bring mass adoption to every blockchain. Um, you know, aside from the uh, technical side, we have a very, very big focus on actual adoption. And we recently launched uh, the world first eSport uh, gaming application on App Store, where you can play eSport game and win crypto prizes uh, in Seller. Um, and uh, you know, using Seller Networks technology, and it's uh, called Seller X. So feel free to uh, try it out. Thank you. Hi. My name is Clarence Liu. I'm from Elasos. Uh, Elasos recently achieved 50% uh, of Bitcoin's hash power, so it's a pre pretty significant um, achievement here. And uh, we are a layer one multi-chain solution. So when you talk multi-chain, it's multiple layer one solutions, and that's pre pretty much how we scale. Um, we use our 50% of Bitcoin's hash power to secure a validator pool, and then that validator pool then provides DPoS uh, consensus for our multiple side chains, and that's how we scale. Hi, I'm Kosala Hemachandra. I'm from My Ether Wallet, and um, those who are familiar with My Ether Wallet already know we are an interface uh, for Ethereum blockchains. Um, mainly, I'm here to talk about use cases and what some of these scaling solutions will be beneficial for Ethereum in general and for the people uh, who are using it and how we as an interface can improve that experience and give uh, users a better usability and accessibility to Ethereum space. Hi everyone, my name is Max Cantelia and uh, I'm a founder at Silica and CEO of its parent company, which is called Anshwen. Uh, so at Silica, we tried to solve this, this trilemma and what we've actually done at, at Silica, some of you may well be aware of, is that we've actually successfully used sharding to launch a high throughput public blockchain. Um, in addition to that, we are rather different to some of the other major protocols in that we use proof of work um, only for minor identity, uh, together with PBFT, which means that essentially um, we are, we're really um, uh, energy efficient in, in how we work as a, as a protocol. Um, the third uh, piece of the trilemma, security, um, at a network level, but also at a smart contract level, we've, uh, we've solved by um, writing our own smart contract language, which is called Scylla, which actually went live in, in June of this year. Uh, we launched our mainnet in January, um, and now really for us it's about adoption, and um, perhaps later on we'll, we'll talk about, talk about some, some of the use cases that are building on top of Silica. Awesome. Um, so I have a, a list of questions, but the format is going to look like this. Uh, every, for every question, there will be a uh, someone who will, one of the panelists will lead, um, and then the other one, uh, everyone else can can chime in afterwards. So, I guess first question for uh, for Clarence, uh, piggybacking off of uh, what Max just mentioned, the uh, security, uh, scalability, and uh, decentralization trilemma. Have we solved this problem? So first. 
is everyone, I'm pretty sure everyone's aware of the blockchain tri trilemma, right? It's been pretty much spoken, spoken about everywhere. Um, so security, scalability, and decentralization, right? Um, and to be honest, I think that we've, there's a few projects that have solved it, solved it um, usually using uh, Algorand's one of them that I think has pretty much solved it conceptually. Um, but there's always trade-offs, I think. So we're able to get really close, but um, for example, with Algorand, I believe that their smart contracts language is very primitive. Um, that's one issue. Um, for Elastos, we are horizontally scaling, and so we are in a way sharded as well. We have that issue, right? So we're pretty much there. Uh, I think it's just as long as you're cognizant of the trade-offs, um, you can achieve it to suit your uh, product. Anybody else has something to chime in? Well, uh, I mean, I can chime in here. So, uh, you know, this trilemma has been talked uh, about so much, and uh, uh, I think to a point that uh, everyone lost, uh, you know, what exactly does that mean? Uh, because, like, uh, I, you know, uh, you can you can pretty much pick any series, three things together and put it in any kind of engineering problem, and then they definitely will have trade-offs as long as they are not exactly the same thing. So, uh, you know, from from uh, from my perspective, uh, what re no, nobody cares about like whether uh, you know you solve the trilemma or not, like today. Um, the, uh, the, the, the key thing that I think, uh, you know, from us, like the more and more we see, is the adoption that actually matters, right? So what is the uh, scalability problem that, is, uh, that are facing by the applications, facing by the users, facing by the developers that eagerly need to be solved? What are some of these problems? And, uh, you know, what are some of the use cases for that? Right, so uh, you know, in in my view, like the priority of the problem would be uh, latency of interactions for applications, and then um, maybe transaction per second, which is basically the capacity of or source port of the network, which you know is different from the latency and interactiveness, and then maybe storage uh, in that order. Um, so yeah, yeah, I I'm totally agree. So it's you know, everyone has talked about how adoption is going to work, right? And it's really coming down to when users don't really know they're using blockchain anymore, as long as users have a good experience, the usability is there, then everything's fine. And I think if we just, you know, on the back end, we'll figure out the trade-offs, but as long as we make sure that the, the experience is there for the users, I mean, I, that has been solved. I think we can do that already. So we were able to provide experiences to users that are latency, pretty good latency, and that's pretty much good enough, as that's probably what you're saying, right? Yeah, to add to Clarence's point, um, this is a question that we get asked often, like, if, if Facebook can do it, or if Twitter can scale, like why can't you guys do it? It comes down to centralized solutions versus decentralized solutions. It's not something, just Clarence said something, a good tweet just before the panel saying, trust cannot scale. Um, oh, did I say it right? Yeah, tr trust can't really scale. Right? Yeah, trust can't really scale. So um, yeah, to add to that point, like when you have a centralized solution, it's there are some trade-offs, like the trade-offs that we have to do are not really applicable in a centralized environment um, where like when you talk to a general audience that they they don't think about those things they want to have a good user experience that they don't realize then they're using a decentralized environment or like a blockchain um, that's what they're after but unfortunately like these are the these are the scaling issues that we have to solve um, in the near future or like in a couple of years at least, in order for the users to have a good experience um, that they don't realize they're in a blockchain space or a regular centralized environment. But we have to do it in a trustworthy manner so that no one, one person cannot screw the whole thing up. So um, I guess more, uh, so pretty much everyone mentioned uh, the word trade-off. Uh, obviously there's the trade-off between scalability to centralization, but more specifically, what are some of the technical trade-offs uh, that, that you guys have, have encountered and how that might um, enable or disable certain use cases? I guess, uh, I guess this is mostly a question for, for Mo since you've worked a lot on, um, on the technical side of uh, Seller. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I can probably speak, uh, should, I, I'm not like from the layer one community, I can probably speak on the uh, uh, layer two trade-offs. Uh, so layer two scalability itself uh, is a very large uh, design space. It uh, originated from uh, the concept of Lightning Network and then evolved so much after that. You guys probably heard like 100 different flavors of Plasma, for example, right? So. 
Uh, you know, but the overall idea of layer two is uh, pretty simple. That is, uh, it is taking a cautiously optimistic uh, approach towards the uh, blockchain ecosystem. That is basically saying that, okay, for most of the time, we assume that everyone is going to cooperate or some party of the network is going to cooperate. And uh, uh, then, you know, in, in the worst case, we still have the layer one as a final adjudication layer and treating the layer one as a settlement layer instead of a central processing power. And uh, you know, uh, on on the but on the layer two space, there are different trade points. For example, uh, you know, uh, we started building layer two scaling solutions uh, with uh, state channel networks or generalized state, cha state channel networks. The benefit of state channel is it's first of all a uh, significant extension on the existing payment network idea, which uh, uh, created by Lightning. Uh, so it is very, very, in, uh, so the application built on top of state channel can be extremely interactive, instant transactions. Um, there's a, absolutely no kind of a feeling of lagginess of blockchain, no confirmation time. And in many cases, if it is running a smart contract, let's say we're playing a chess game on a state channel, uh, it's zero transaction fee. Um, because the, the smart contract transaction really only happens inside of the, uh, the local node. Um, but it also comes with trade-offs. Now the trade-off is that uh, uh, for state channel technology, you need to have defined party in the interaction. You basically, in that particular session, you need to say, that, okay, there are five peop people interacting in, in this particular session, even though you can build a very decentralized network underlying that to connect everyone together, but in a, every particular application session, the party is defined. Now there's, a, then there's a plasma. Plasma is basically saying that, okay, uh, you know, you have uh, all these uh, uh, transactions you can pack inside of a Plasma block and you summarize that block into a root, bl uh, root block in the main chain. Um, but uh, there you face the problem of data availability. You have to kind of challenge the data availability if it's not there. And then there's uh, most recently the hybrid layer two, which is basically saying that, uh, okay, let's forget about the data scaling for the moment. Let's put literally every transaction on the blockchain to solve this availability problem uh, to, in, uh, to basically increase the, the cost of transaction executing, but at the same time uh, have uh, you know, instant finality in the case of a zero knowledge roll up and in the case of your optimism Roll up, you have a challenge period as well. So there are different kind of a trade-off plays you can uh, you can play. But the important thing here is to have a overall approach that is uh, encompassing all these kind of a different trade-off trade points to build a different application on top. And for us, for example, in the state channel space, we started building the eSport uh, gaming application, which requires uh, very much the interactiveness uh, of uh, um, the uh, the layer two scaling solution, but we are expanding to uh, multiple different kind of a state scaling technologies to combine them under a, sing a single roof um, as kind of a coherent solution. I, and then I guess I'll take on uh, layer one and zero since I'm the other technical here, uh, technical person here. So layer one, so layer one really does touch on that blockchain trilemma issue, right? So. By layer one scaling solutions, we obviously talk about changing the consensus model from POW to DPoS or POS, bonded POS, right? So that's everyone probably very familiar with that. Um, or there's horizontal scaling, so sharding, and in our case, we use side chains, which is then multiple layer ones. And then there's also layer zero, which is increasing the, or decreasing the latency between the nodes, because we have to reach consensus, right? And the faster so we can, faster we can communicate, um, the faster everything runs. And I mean, you, so at layer one, you can choose a different strategy. Um, personally, I feel like DPoS does have issues with centralization, does have issues with uh, collusion. Um, if I ask myself, or ask yourself, if DPoS will stand the test of time, I would say most people would say no, right? Do you really think that human nature, do you really think that these DPoS solutions are gonna you know, survive for 100 or 1,000 years, and here we are building a decentralized ecosystem of the world, of the future, and we're not, we, you know, we wanna build something that can last thousands of years, right? So I would say DPoS is kind of the first step. I, I believe where the future is headed for layer one solutions is adding pseudo-random solutions to it. So that is where Algorand, uh, Definity come to play. Elasos is also working on uh, Lasso's a project called Leo with, with the World Bank where we're also exploring um, randomness. So I, I believe that's kind of where you might see a lot of uh, improvements coming from the layer one side. And layer zero is very straightforward, you know, connecting the nodes faster. And there's always a theoretical limit to how fast you can communicate, which is the speed of light, right? So I mean, you're gonna get to that point eventually. That's 
pretty boring, but I believe that Marlin protocol is, they're the ones working on that one. Clarence, could, could you define a little bit layer zero versus layer one? Uh, what, what are these two? Sure, these yeah, terms? so layer one is what you're all used to. Layer one, that's the blockchains themselves, right? This is kind of the settlement layer that eventually this has to agree, right? That is the state of the world. That's the consensus that we talk about. So just when we ever talk about layer one scaling, just how fast um, can we reach consensus, right? Each block is a consensus, right? So how fast can we transition from one state to another state? Is that's the layer one, mm -hmm. you know, that's the goal, right? If we can transition, if we have one second blocks, that's amazing, right? But it's very difficult. Layer zero is not really talked about very often because it's uh, not really a blockchain thing. It's just, we're just saying, hey, all right, let's make the communications between the nodes faster. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Making nodes faster on the hardware layer or on the uh, network, network layer? layer yeah. N uh, network layer, so? Yeah, right, so using the net, just making the networks faster so that the, these, these nodes can communicate, right? Um, it's, I might go on a long winded discussion here, but I mean, when we, whenever we want to increase decentralization, we want to increase the number of nodes. And the more number of nodes we have, the faster a network has to be because all these nodes have to talk to each other. So that's the fundamental problem. Why you need layer zero is we want to add more nodes, right? And if you want more nodes, you need better networks. To talk a little bit about Ethereum layer one um, scaling solutions, um, we are currently working on, I believe, two uh, main ones, sh one sharding and then POS. Um, the main, like actually we currently do ha already have a scaling solution and I'll tell you why it's not working. Um, the main, like that's, when I say a scaling solution is like number of transactions you can include per block. So simply you can increase the block gas limit and you can call it, you can just simply double it and be like, hey, we can include double the amount of transactions that a block can handle as of right now. But unfortunately that's also gonna eliminate, this is one of the trade-offs. Uh, this is also gonna eliminate um, I'd say like less than half of the uh, nodes out there in uh, Ethereum space because not all the nodes are at, has the exact same capabilities of processing all the transactions at the exact same speed. So if you have to include 100 transactions versus 200 transactions, all the nodes are not gonna be able to process them within the 14 second block time. And this is gonna eliminate a lot of nodes out of the Ethereum space. And this is exactly why you cannot simply increase the block gas limit and call it a day and be like, hey, like, oh, we scaled. Uh, that's not gonna work. And But like in a centralized environment, since the people or like the centralized company controls all the nodes, you, they can simply uh, make all the nodes equally capable of doing all the processing power. And this is, this is gonna solve the issue for them. But that's, unfortunately, that's not the case in, a, uh, in, in, in our case. And then um, when you talk about sharding, it's pretty much just that's the, the other solution, I mean, one of the actual solutions that will work eventually will be uh, not asking all the nodes to process all the transactions. So think of it this way, if you, if currently, if there are 100 transactions in a block, each and every node in the world has to process that 100 transactions in a timely manner so that it can be included in a block. But what if only, uh, only 50, only all, uh, not all the nodes has to process all 100, like only they have to process 50 transactions and then you can just group them into two groups. So one group process 50 and the other groups process 50. So now they only have to worry about processing 50 transactions to half the amount and get, in, get it included in the block. So now think of it as just n number of nodes, right? N number of shards. So you can just exponentially reduce the amount of uh, transactions that you have to process in a timely manner uh, in order to be in order for that transaction to be included in a block um, and then POS is proof of staking where you just simply stake your ETH um, this goes in hand in hand with shards sharding actually so you um, so you stake your ETH and then let a smart contract handle all the processing or like uh, validity of the transactions and now you don't you are completely eliminating proof of work which is in one way more expensive and not environmentally friendly. Uh, your electricity bill gonna go skyrocket. So all these issues, you're practically eliminating all those issues. But like we talked before, there are a ton of trade-offs that, and like a ton of issues that we have to fix before we get to that point. I'd like to answer your question in a slightly different way to, to my very, very technical um, 
uh, peers here, um, which is that, from my perspective, looking at this trade-off question from not so much from the, the, the technical perspective, but more so from the adoption perspective, I think is very important to talk about because certainly we've been finding as we've been looking um, at enterprise adoption of blockchain that ultimately security is, is the one thing people do not want compromised in any way. And so, um, whilst you know our our uh, the, the core Zilliqa team is made up of some phenomenal academics, um, and and we can we can debate the the you know the at an academic level all day long, um, but but ultimately for me you know in terms of answering this question about what trade offs are, are are you know least and most important when it comes to big enterprise adoption, then then I think we have to think about security because we've seen what happens when when that goes when that goes wrong so so I, I, I think that that you know um, uh, yes we can try and create a perfect piece of technology but we must look at it from the the, 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 the adoption perspective you know whether it's people building dapps or, or large enterprises wanting to build enterprise applications uh, Max could you uh, define security um, a little bit more? So that's a good question because um, I think that security in a blockchain environment actually has two core components. So one is network security, and 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 of course, you know the um, the way in which your consensus mechanism works uh, is is very very important in in speaking to 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 that kind of network security level. But I think the second thing is um, uh, application security. And we've, again, we've been very, very bold in designing our own smart contract language. Why on earth did we do that? Well, we did that because although our smart contract language is, is non-Turing complete, what we can do is formally mathematically verify that when a smart contract is put together, that it actually has no bugs in it. And we've seen what happens when um, you know, when, when other smart contract languages are used that, that may be very much more expressive and Turing complete, but um, you know, coder, a coder makes an invet inveterate programming error and that, get, that gets exploited and then, then we have, when we have major, major, major problems. So I think also um, certainly enterprise, um, uh, enterprises are very interested in how smart contracts work but they're also aware that that that, that, that can create, um, you know, vulnerability. So, so for, for for me, I think the answer breaks down into two two separate things. I guess uh, I also have a follow-up question for Kasala. Uh, you mentioned uh, in Ethereum, which everyone here cares about, obviously. Uh, there's um, um, sharding, uh, which is fairly intuitive to me. Um, uh, you know, you basically divide the number of computations uh, in different groups. Uh, every group computes a subset of the total required number of computations. But uh, proof of stake, um, how does how does proof of stake actually help with scaling? If, uh, could you expand more uh, on that? Uh, I guess, in uh, relatively to proof of work, right? Because yeah. uh, scaling is always re relative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So proof of work is mainly. Like I mentioned before, every single um, this is why I said like the sharding and proof of stake will go hand in hand, hand in hand with uh, in Ethereum space, because um, so proof of work like currently the way it works is that every single miner has to process every single transaction versus when it goes to sharding like uh, it'll be set of uh, like groups of people uh, processing certain amount of transactions and when you take it and put it in con control of a smart contract. Um, which are uh, staked, like it has, eat, it eats staked. In one way, it's gonna help the inflation because you're gonna reduce the amount of ETH in, 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 in um, like ETH that can be used. Um, the, on the other side, it's gonna uh, let certain amount of people or like pools of people to stake their ETH in a smart contract, which is gonna handle all the processing of the transactions. 
So it's gonna validate and it's gonna make sure these transactions are valid. So pretty much think of it as you no longer have to run uh, big computers or like big machines to do the processing side of transactions. It's just gonna be handled by uh, Ethereum smart contracts. The way that it's gonna help the scaling issue is that since these, are, these smart contracts are very deterministic and only supposed to do a certain task, it can handle a um, ton of transactions or like validate ton of transactions, or it can, we can even think about like layer two solutions where it, can on, it, does, it only has to validate the Merkle proof of like certain event or like the whole transaction. So it's not, it's not, it's, it's gonna be able to handle um, from a non-technical way that's a lot more transactions than what proof of work can handle. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. <laughs> Um, smart contracts are better. Smart contracts are better. Oh, well. <laughs> I said smart contracts are better than proof of work. <laughs> no. Any, no. Any, uh, I think you're mixing up smart contracts and POS and POW. Um, maybe try to, do you have a really good analogy or do maybe I, I'll take a stab at sort of POW and POS. Um, so POW is really just, you know, you, you're just adding one plus one, right? And in PO, POW world, you get an answer two, and all we're saying is, well, if you have an incentive to be malicious and say three, um, in POW, we just make it really expensive to say three, and you don't want to, you want to say two, because if you spend all the money and you say three and you get caught, you wasted all the energy for nothing. You should reach that. In POW, you're staking, and you're just saying, I'm putting down $100 that, you know, the answer is two or three, and we get, you get caught saying three when it should be two, then we just penalize you and take that money, right? So that's just incentives based, but no matter what, at the end of the day, we just want to get that answer and all of us to agree on that answer. It's pretty straightforward that um, burning all this electricity is super slow to do the hashing for POW. POS, you're really just calculating the answer, which takes a nanosecond, one plus one, two, and you agree and you just move on to the next block. That, that's, that's why POS is so much faster, but then you have collusion, right? That can happen, so if the, uh, there's a way that if we all can collude and say the answer is actually three um, and we can make money off that and get away with it, then that's the problem, right? Uh, that, that's basically it. That's why we have to stop that and why POS is so hard to fight against because humans naturally collude. And that's why I, I always go back to some, you know, the pseudo random techniques that might actually make that better or, you know, pretty much the blockchain world is split into POW and POS. And in POS, you hear all these fancy terms like POI or proof, you know, proof of importance or random ones, but they're all just different mitigations for POS. How do we stop people from colluding, right? Um, and everyone has their own idea of how we stop people from colluding, and I think it's just a rabbit hole because you'll never, at the end of the day, I don't think people always collude, so that's, that's my opinion. How about you? What, do you? what do you think about POS? Do you think POS will really stand the test of time? Maybe that's kind of like yeah, so, uh, well, I, I, okay, so POS versus POW in terms of scalability is like, uh, um, you know, one aspect of this, uh, but I think, um, you know, the, the initial motivation to introduce POS is uh, uh, energy consumption uh, side and also introducing the capability called a finality. Um, you know, in POW, you really don't have a finality. What you have is probabilistic finality. Finality is basically a point of no return. Um, you know, uh, today, you can imagine if there is a, a supernatural power uh, that can kind of reverse all Bitcoin uh, blockchain transactions, that is still possible because, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, uses a very, very simple fork choice rule, which is the longest chain fork choice rule. Um, but in POS, uh, because of this uh, economic, uh, crypto economics incentive structure redesign, uh, you can introduce something called um, a finality which basically means that uh, uh, with a certain kind of conditions, this block will be final, means that uh, in this particular chain, uh, there's no way to revert that block or all that rea reality. And that is a, a significant benefit of uh, uh, POS, at least what the POS is trying to do, um, all side of the scaling, I think. You know, in terms of get scalability, uh, I don't see that it's fundamentally solved because it still involves the communication overhead, uh, still involves uh, uh, you know, um, all the other overhead involved in the consensus process. Um, the consensus algorithm itself um, you know, improves basically.
you know, it, it's, it, it solves that a little bit by improving the consensus, but the communication delay is uh, there, and we're still running a decentralized uh, e system. You just cannot get that bond if you're having a full, uh, decentralized enough, uh, you know, system, basically. Yeah. Um, I, I want to uh, uh, piggyback off of what uh, almost everyone mentioned uh, in terms of adoption. Um, um, I, uh, so in this industry, I, I have a constant struggle between like a personal struggle between idealism and pragmatism. I'm always like, okay, this crypto thing is gonna change the world and blah, 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 it's gonna you know, unbank, unbank the bank and, and bank the unbanked and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's been 10 years and frankly, we've only had two products with, two crypto networks with uh, product market fit, which is, for me, it's, it's, it's Bitcoin as a store value and to some extent, it's uh, uh, stable coin, uh, tethered and notably. Uh, which is uh, used um, very widely in in, uh, in Asia, uh, but again as a um, store of value and and in, in in some way as a method of of, of wealth. Um, but outside of these two, there is nothing really. Uh, there is no product that really has product market fit uh, outside of speculation, right? Outside of trading. So we can sit here all day, talk about technology and scaling and all that, but at the end of the day, none of this matters if we don't have adoption, if we don't have use cases. So um, obviously there's a lot of trade-offs that we just talked about. Um, my, my question for um, the, every panelist uh, is, um, what are some of the uh, use cases that uh, realistically these new scaling technologies can enable? And um, obviously, that will depend on the on the trade-off. So, um, curious what uh, everyone thinks. Uh, I guess um, both in the near future, right, like 2020, uh, and also maybe five to ten years. Curious what everyone what everyone thinks. Yeah, I can start. Uh, so I, I think on the adoption side, it's uh, it's uh, it, all the adoption questions the surrounding. I think at this stage. Uh, the blockchain technology is uh, still relatively new, but I think it is uh, mature enough you can think about niche markets, right? So like, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, th this time is the time where uh, the Amazon who s s uh, sold the books may come out. Uh, the uh, uh, Tencent who just did a, a, a kind of a chat software may come out. That kind of a niche market um, can be something that defines the future of adoption starting very, very narrow vertical. And uh, to find that narrow vertical, the vertical itself, of course, needs to be big enough to sustain a company, to sustain kind of an ecosystem, uh, but all need to kind of uh, extremely suitable for blockchain technology in general, and then the technology built on top. That's kind of a, how we approach our, uh, the, our methodology in terms of the thinking about adoption, in terms of finding a particular market niche. Um, there are uh, a lot of adoption floating around uh, things like uh, DeFi. I'm, I'm actually extremely pessimistic about the, uh, decentralized finance. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, NFT tokens, uh, the whole gaming ecosystem surrounding with non-fungible tokens, uh, which I also think is going to encounter significant challenge when merging with the, the traditional application ecosystem for both developers and publishers. Um, but f for us, uh, you know, just to continue show my own project here, uh, and uh, you know the the niche that we found is uh, uh, real money esport, uh, so skill based real money esport. Um, this particular niche um, leverages the capability of the global flat financial system, where you know our platform there are 88 different countries of uh, uh, 88 uh, countries the users are playing with each other constantly, and also leverage the fact that a, a blockchain uh, you know uh, on ramp in terms of uh, money on ramp and transfer is just uh, so much fundamentally cheaper comparing to traditional financial means. Uh, you know, if uh, let's say we, I want to run an eSports site, uh, you know, uh, yeah, using Visa or MasterCard, um, this will be classified as high risk business and the, the high risk business has insanely high transaction fee you don't even want to know about. And, um, you know, for that, blockchain fundamentally has an advantage, has an edge there in terms of running a business on blockchain, running a business uh, even with uh, some friction on the fiat on RAM, it's still worth it. And, uh, you know, 
And then there's the, the technology piece that is, uh, you know, on the scaling front, uh, you know, we have been focusing on reducing the latency and interactiveness of the application. And uh, uh, eSport game and this kind of a human-to-human -human interaction is something that uh, has been our thesis and, uh, you know, have been something that we try to enable because we believe the internet enabled the human-to-human -human communication or human-to-human -human interaction on information instantly. And I think the first step towards mass adoption for blockchain might be um, you know, uh, instant and real-time interaction on value. And you know, just the, the eSport, real money eSport thing is just a, a very nice niche to cut into in the beginning. So I, so, uh, I guess just to be clear, uh, uh, you mean eSports uh, e -sports games uh, being built on top of Seller? Like, uh, That's like, right. Like, yeah. uh, like what part? Like the, all the entire stack on, on top of seller, or yeah. you know, so part of you can, for example, you can play, uh, you know, a, a, a quick chess, or you can play, uh, you know, interactive board games. Um, all these board games on top of seller um, is fully decentralized, fully trust-free, uh, but at the same time, you don't experience any of the blockchain delay uh, that you use usually experience today. Uh, so we provide the user with a very familiar user interface, uh, user experience, but at, at the same time, uh, cutting down the cost uh, uh, on operating this and also like, uh, you know, uh, just that, yeah. I have a brutally honest question afterwards. But uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, go with uh, Clarence. Well, you know, feel free to ask now. Uh, it's know. probably a question for everybody in this, okay, in this room. Right. But uh, let's let's go with uh, Clarence. Yeah, just to add, a, just quickly clarify on him. Yeah, so that when they do layer two, they, if you specify the number of users, you can be really fast. So if just six people playing a FPS shooter, uh, layer two works very well. Okay, so for a last toast, um, we use dedicated side chains, so multi chains. So when we scale horizontally with multiple layer one, similar to sharding, right? I guess sharding is more like um, geographically distributing into shards. For us, we distribute individual side chains or dedicated side chains for each product or project uh, or ecosystem. And for us, ecosystems is where we're really focused on. So um, we have different ecosystems for, um, in Malaysia, we have a partnership with Daxi, which is building a, a, a ride hailing ecosystem and then linking it with uh, you know, another ecosystem in Thailand for spas and wellness. And then we have another ecosystem for IoT we're running out of Singapore. So each ecosystem can run on a dedicated side chain. However, talking to other side chains does have a bit of uh, overhead there. But that's how we can scale and build out these entire ecosystems for Lassos. And just a little bit of shameless uh, shilling too. Um, you know, Lassos was one of the top 10 raises of 2018, 60 million dollars. So we're using half of that that we've set aside now to uh, fund these ecosystems. So Lassos is giving out 1.6 million dollars in grants every year now. And you know, if anyone wants to build an ecosystem or join one of these ecosystems, I mean, Lassos is trying to give us uh, dedicated uh, uh, side chains for each ecosystem. Yeah, so being an interface in Ethereum space and not directly dealing with any of the technical um, scaling solutions, um, our benefit from a good scaling solution will be directly um, helping users to have like cheaper transactions, more transactions per second. And I'm gonna go with the most cliche example that uh, Visa can process 17,500 transactions per second and unfortunately Ethereum can only do 15 transactions per second as of right now. So, um, and having about like, we do about like 200,000 transactions um, a day, that's, that's a huge uh, difference that if we, if we can have a good scaling solution, we can just process it in, I don't know, like 10, instead of like 10 seconds versus whatever it takes right now. So um, it'll be directly beneficial, and Ma already talked about gaming. Um, CryptoKitties can be a very good example um, and on on-chain gaming that would have gone a lot better or like a lot smoother um, if we already had a good scaling solution. And um, talking about like uh, plasma chain, that's something that we're directly working with. And um, if we can implement that, and like for example, like think of tic tac toe as a, a game, and then you know it, the number of players who are deterministic, two players, and then uh, all the moves can be deterministic as well. So instead of doing all the transactions on chain and taking forever, we can do all the transactions off chain and publish one transaction to the network and then verify the whole game. So um, things like that can improve the user experience uh, in a very drastic manner and it'll, it'll almost make it 
impossible for a user or like a new user to see, oh, I'm, I'm, using, a, I'm using a blockchain or I'm using a regular tic-tac-toe game that's like on a server. Um, so that's, that's what we are after. We are after giving the user a better user experience from all these scaling solutions. So uh, in terms of use cases for scalable blockchains, um, the first thing I would say is that, probably a lot older than most of the people in this room, but to me we're in 1993 and it's Netscape browser. And you know Google's still five years away from being born. And I, I think that we, we have to understand that this is, um, this is still a very early stage technology. And whether you look at the user experience or you look at the developer experience, um, the developer experience is seriously awkward today. So we have to fix a lot of things around the usability of this technology, scalable or not, um, in order to find the right use cases. But I certainly think that you know the hype bubble has 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 burst somewhat. You know, four, four or five years ago, CEOs of Wall Street banks were standing up and saying it was going to be the cure for cancer. Um, and we, we all know that use cases, certainly for public scalable blockchains, are not ubiquitous. You know, they're, they're, they're not everywhere. Um, from, from our experience, certainly, I mean, you know, some of, uh, some of you have alluded to, um, for example, you know, the tra transfer of value pa payments. Um, and there are many, many noteworthy examples of how you can use a, uh, you know, a a public blockchain to execute cross-border cross transactions at very low cost and, and in virtual real time. Um, I think those sorts of use cases, I mean, mo most, most applications are predicated upon some, some form of payment. Um, uh, we've also seen, for example, we, we, we're exploring DeFi. I think it's very, very, a very interesting space um, and, and certainly in, in emerging markets. Uh, we are already working um, very closely with some very large multinationals around the digital advertising space, which um, ultimately for me boils down to the fact that I think blockchain um, does provide an excellent use case for anything where you have a supply chain where there might be a lack of trust. And I, I think that, um, yes, we've got to tackle things like data privacy issues and and, and all of these things, um, but but that can be done, uh, and and so um, I think there are there are excellent use cases for layer one, layer two solutions around these supply chains, and um, I think digital advertising is certainly one where uh, um, we we need safety and we need scalability um, because 15 transactions per second isn't going to cut it. So I guess. Um my, my brutally honest question for everybody is, um, you know, if we think about Bitcoin or, or DeFi, whether or not they succeed is another story, but the, the fundamental reason for using a blockchain for these two um, sectors makes sense to me. So Bitcoin, for instance, uh, you want decentralization because you don't want any one person or entity to control the monetary supply. Uh, DeFi, you want decentralization because you want a system where um, users can access to can have access to banking or some financial services in a permissionless way. Um, so these these intuition like these um, motivations make sense make sense to me. But when we talk about things like uh, you know uh, uh, enterprise use cases or gaming, why do people need decentralization? So I, I think. No discussion about blockchain is complete without talking about zero knowledge. So when you talk about what, what are you're basically asking, what are some intuitive use cases of blockchain that say you think that definitely? Well, my, my question is is more like uh, we have a traditional tech stack like pre blockchain era tech stack. Yeah. Why can't people use that tech stack versus uh, the blockchain uh, tech stack? So for for example, so zero knowledge. If anyone's not familiar with zero knowledge, the ability to um, turn, turn the tables and say, let's say I have some health data and I don't want to give them my identity, but here's my um, health data. If you can find a problem with me, you can escrow some money and say, I found a problem with you, I can prove it, 
I've put some money up, give me your identity, and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, expose my identity, and then you can make that money. If I, I called it out wrong, then you keep the money. Like these type of situations, I think, anytime we're managing your own data and re like um, taking back control of your data, that's where blockchain can really make a difference. And so zero knowledge is Im really important. And this is not, this is totally blockchain agnostic. It's a, crypt it's a cryptography, yep. right? At the end of the day, it's cryptography. It's about, but cryptography by itself wouldn't work, wouldn't solve the problem. You need blockchain to have that mutability to say, hey, I make this declaration. I have this commitment, the zero knowledge commitment here. Um, and then now you can have whole new business use cases where, like I said, you could take your consumer data and then in a zero knowledge way prove that you have a certain amount of money or you have certain interests. And then advertisers or salespeople can say, hey, I want to know your identity. You've proven that you are these things. I'll pay you some money. That was not possible before blockchain and zero knowledge proofs. So um, this is possible. And now also, with like DeFi and things like that, you can start, you could build this without blockchain. You could trust certain entities, right? But this, when I speak about ex escrowing or depositing money and stuff like that, um, now a developer can just build that. They don't have to go through some bank to say, hey, I need an escrow agent, right? I can just write a smart contract to do that. So it lowers the friction for all these things that zero knowledge makes possible, I would say. Yeah, let me be uh, quite concrete here. So. Uh, you know, first of all, I, I strongly disagree that DeFi has not anything to do with our banks. DeFi is a basically a big, big crypto pawn shop. Um, you know, you basically pawn your crypto and then you get some uh, liquidity out and you, you do trading stuff. So, um, but, uh, you know, uh, coming back to a very concrete point, um, you know, for us, uh, or for the first niche market that we find, uh, why we use eSport as a kind of a first niche market to attack, very simple. It's 10 times cheaper than traditional financial means. That's it. Sir, can you say that last part again? Oh yeah, it's uh, it's ten times it's, it's ten times cheaper uh, to let users uh, play games and transact, and uh, basically the operational cost, the financial operational cost, if using crypto, is actually ten times cheaper. Cheaper for the user, yeah. for for us, for for the for the operators of the network, and therefore for the users. Yeah, for for, for the global GDP too, six percent I believe is lost in financial friction, right? So DeFi fixes that. If you get rid of, that, rid of that financial friction, that's a lot of money that we're wasting on intermediaries, right? So that's that's where blockchain and DeFi come into play. So I, I agree with both of your points in terms of financial transactions, right? Like it, it makes sense, um, but uh, I'm more talking about use cases like you know building games uh, on the blockchain stack or enterprise uh, applications on the blockchain stack. Why why is decentralization needed for, for these things? For developers, they can access a much uh, a wider uh, monetization flow because you know, uh, in traditional, let's say you build this using Visa and MasterCard, you need to uh, enter the country, country by country, and uh, the monetization flow is just uh, so much slower comparing to if uh, they port the uh, game onto our platform and the you know, monetization scope is much, much larger, basically. Yeah, yeah, borders are a big problem. Like uh, in, in the creative industries, um, you know, if, if a, mu a musician plays a song somewhere, that has to get collected by the publishing rights organization of that country and then transmitted through many intermediaries before it gets to the artist and they lose, they get like 15 cents on a dollar when it gets to them. And that, that's things that we can fix, right? I think uh, we're... Uh Time's up, but uh, great conversation. Uh, I learned a lot. Hope everybody uh, also learned uh, a lot from our uh, great panelists. So thanks to everyone. So thank you. Thank you.